All right. Welcome everyone to the UTIG discussion hour. Today we have um, Edward Clennett with us. He's a second year PhD student. He got his undergrad degree and master's degree from the University of Oxford. Um, and today he's going to be telling us about his master's work at, at Oxford, which was on uh, plate reconstruction in Western North America. Take it away. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Erin. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to present my master's work on uh, the, the tectonic history of Western North America and the Eastern Pacific. Um, which I did with collaborations um, with the University of Sydney and the British Columbia Geological Survey. So, um, oh, okay. uh, so yeah, plate reconstruction models, um, they use a lot of different data sets and uh, traditionally they're mainly constrained using uh, marine geophysics. So that's things like your magnetic lineations and anomalies uh, on ocean crust and then the fracture zones, as well as hotspot tracks. So the, uh, the ages of the magnetic anomalies can tell you the, the spreading rate, and then the fracture zones can tell you the, the direction, because spreading is usually parallel to these, to these fracture zones. Um, and then you can combine these with hotspot tracks and oceans to sort of anchor these in a global reference frame. And then uh, in continental regions, you usually use paleomagnetic data, so you can have uh, apparent polar wonder paths like this one, and that can tell you sort of the latitudinal motion of continents. And finally, the last thing that has been used in these traditional reconstructions is continental geology. So you can uh, look at the western margin of North America, and there's lots of these different terrains. And from things like detrital zircons, you can work out sort of where they came from, either like Siberia, Baltica here, or more North American setting. And so this has been really, really useful in uh, building these global plate reconstruction models. Um, but the problem with Western North America and the Eastern Pacific is that there's a subduction regime. So most of your seafloor, like the Farallon plate, the Izanagi plate, you have no surviving uh, evidence of how big this plate was or, or how it was moving other than by when it's very close to the Pacific plate. So uh, yeah, indeed, more than 95% of the Pacific and Panthalassa, which was the precursor to the Pacific uh, crust has been subducted. And a further complication is that the North American Cordillera uh, is made up of a lot of accreted terrains uh, with exotic affinities, which um, uh, have been termed suspect terrains. And so, uh, since many of these uh, terrains and uh, ge geological provinces uh, are not part of uh, North America, it becomes very difficult to actually work out what was going in this region. So um, these are the sort of traditional views and the historic models of uh, the Cretaceous uh, tectonic history. So you can look at the Pacific plate isochrons and work out that there are these like major plates, Izanagi and Farallon. And so uh, these models just sort of extrapolated it to the margin and uh, modeled um, like a uh, subduction beneath the continent of this whole plate, even though like most of this plate, you, you don't know how big it was because it's all, all the evidence is lost to subduction. And then uh, they sometimes model these small back arts opening and closing. Um, and that's been the sort of prevalent view of the history of uh, Western North America and the Eastern Pacific. Uh, so when you look at the, the geology along the margin, it's very clear that there's a very long history of subduction. You've got lots of different stages of arc volcanism, um, either with like intrusive plutons into the continent or some terrains that show clear like island arc uh, signatures. And uh, there's uh, four arc basins, accretion complexes, and abduction of ophiolites, um, as well as some terrains that show uh, uh, sedimental, sedimentary signatures that are not from North America, as well as exotic fossils, which also indicate that they were far traveled and came from uh, different places, as well as um, different paleomagnetic latitude paths compared with just the North American craton. And so 
Uh, lots of previous geological studies have tried to work out um, what these small terrains or like geological provinces, like small microcontinents were doing. And so there have been some views that say, oh, it was always subducting beneath North America. And then to get these sort of oceanic basins in between these, these two terrains, you've got to have like shuffling up and down and trapping them uh, inside, which is how you could get a basin inside. Or uh, perhaps a uh, more simple way is it like it literally was just two uh, ocean between these terrains and they accreted together. And that's how you get these, these basins in between. So there's sort of two conflicting views from the geology. And so what I did is I looked at uh, the geophysical evidence to see if we can distinguish between these and uh, properly uh, work out what the tectonic history was. So when you look at the mantle structure, there's a really complex geometry of slabs beneath North America. So rather than like matching the, the shape of the margin, you've got this sort of chevron shape. And there's also other slabs that are at the same depth, but there's two, two, two slab packages uh, next to each other. And uh, so for many of these slabs, they're, they're purely vertical for, for up to a thousand kilometers, um, rather than following the sort of inclined shape as North America would move. And uh, crucially, um, when you reconstruct the North America to where it was in the Jurassic, these subduction zones are thousands of kilometers west of the, the continental margin, which is an initial indicator that maybe the, the arcs uh, represent intraoceanic subduction rather than Andean style continental subduction. And so when you combine this geological paleomagnetic tomographic evidence, it does suggest that there is intraoceanic subduction. Uh, for example, here you've got the North American continent, which is thousands of kilometers to the west of where the um, slabs were, which indicate where subduction was happening. And when you look at the geological terrains, you can really trace like a suture of these um, oceanic basins, which goes along the whole margin, which does suggest that there may have been an ocean in between the furthest west part and the, the more interior part. So with this evidence, I aim to look at um, whether a intraoceanic subduction setting is consistent with the, the global plate circuit. And also, can we model this continuously through time? And uh, if that's possible, then we can show how the North American continent was assembled. And so this is the model setup. I uh, use the plate modeling software GPlates, which is a software that you um, digitize a set of boundaries each with uh, different IDs and Euler poles. And then you can uh, select the boundaries to define a plate. And all of these boundaries move independently uh, through time, depending on um, what their Euler pole is. But the, the plate con is, is continuously closed. So it's always consistent with uh, geodynamics. So you could have like a subduction zone that would move with the overriding plate or a spreading ridge, which is sort of like the half rate between the two oceanic plates. And uh, that, that's the, the methodology of this, this software. And I also uh, digitized the 68 terrains that were in that previous terrain map I showed. So you can really see that detailed history of the assembly of the North American Cordillera. And so the, the tomogra tomography models that I used to reconstruct this um, were the, these three different models. One of them is a very regional model using the um, US array, uh, sorry. Um, and uh, so that gives you a very detailed picture of the, the slabs underneath North America. And you can resolve these sort of very linear trenches rather than large blobs because there's less smoothing for that. I also use two global models, in particular the Detox P3 model, which uses core diffracted waves. So that gives you quite good resolution um, of the, the lowermost mantle where these, these ray paths are going along the uh, core mantle boundary and showing you what's right at the bottom of the mantle, uh, which gives you slightly better constraints than maybe some other models for that, those like really, really deep depths. And then I just selected the, the fast anomalies, so like greater than um, a, a, a increase of the p velocity relative to the background of 0.2%. 
and I put these as 3D ISO surfaces. So what that means is that you just take the, um, the fast anomalies, these blue bits, and then you plot them here, and then I stack them on top of each other. So you can still see the deeper depths. And uh, what you see is that it starts with this sort of chevron, and then in this corner, it's sort of the, the slow, it gradually truncates upwards until you get a, a long sort of more straight trench along the margin. And so um, that sort of indicates this sort of model where you have um, uh, a stationary trench and you're building these very vertical slab walls where the slabs are just piling up on top of each other. And then as North America comes along and overrides, you get a more inclined slab that you would expect from continent subduction. And uh, by looking at the, the timing of uh, when the continent overrides this place, you can try and estimate a sinking rate of these slabs, uh, which came out as uh, 10 millimeters a year. And uh, that's like very consistent with uh, sort of geodynamic models and other studies that have used this technique of looking at subductive slabs based on, uh, because there's a viscosity contrast in the lower mantle, which makes these slabs pile up and slow down relative to maybe at the surface where you'd expect a bit to be about 10 times faster. And so, yeah, as you, you track the, the margin overriding this sort of uh, apex of these, this chevron, uh, and matching it also to geological events such as orogenies in North America, that's how you can calculate the sinking rate. And then if you know a sinking rate, then you can, uh, if, if the slab slant vertically, which you'd expect because uh, the, the strongest driving force is the negative buoyancy, so you'd expect them to just sort of sink downwards with relatively less lateral motion. You can say at uh, 900 kilometers depth, that represents uh, the surface location of the trenches not 90 million years ago from the sinking rate. And then uh, I also uh, looked at the reference frame for these. So uh, I implemented it into two different reference frames, uh, which would have like slightly different sinking rates and collision timings um, based on uh, the different reference frames. So one of them is a uh, Seton et al. 2012, which is this red one here, which is sort of relatively more east. And then the Muller et al. 2019 reference frame, which is sort of more westerly. So these sort of give you like an end member distribution. Um, I just want to point out this uh, pink model here, which uh, is, is called the subduction reference frame. And that's like a very similar study to what we did, but instead of sort of identifying this as intraoceanic subduction, what they did is they assume that it was uh, the continent subduction. And they thought, oh, we've got to rotate the entire reference frame so it matches this trench. And so um, that's like a, a, a you know, reasonable result. But what happens is that you get very large misfits to the, the hotspot tracks, which is like one of the other main constraints in global reference frames. Um, and even with doing that, you still don't have a very good match to the, to the slabs. There's still like a thousand kilometers between the margin and, and these slabs here, and you can't really explain what's going on there. So that's why uh, we say, oh, this is maybe based on a false assumption. And uh, let's see what happens if you model intraoceanic subduction. So this was my methodology that I did here. So you look at the tomographic models. Um, and look at where the slabs were at the depth that corresponds to the, the timing of subduction using that sinking rate. And if there's a slab, then that's just where the slab enters the mantle. So that should be a subduction zone. And if there's no slab, then that means it has to be either a transform or a relation ridge. And so by just linking the edge of them, you can sort of build up a, a model of ridges and transforms, depending on whether the, the other plates in the plate circuit are have the sort of spreading motion or, or perpendicular motion. And then uh, to get the, the Euler poles or the, the relative motions of these inferred plates in the intraoceanic uh, regime, you can look at paleomag data from these arcs, which tells you how they moved in latitude space. Um, you can look at the locations of the subduction zones because uh, these trenches should move with the, the overriding plate. And then um, if there's like an oceanic region, then you need to uh, show that there's subduction into that trench. So if there's a little bit of convergence, then that's how you can constrain uh, these lost oceanic plates. And so when you combine all that together, you get your plate reconstruction.
And so I'm just going to highlight some key events that I share, and then I'll show you the whole model. So you know sort of what to look out for. But um, at the uh, 180 million years ago, uh, that's when you have lots of tectonic events happening in the Pacific. So you got um, the initiation of spreading in the in the Pacific, like the oldest Pacific crust is around 180 million years old, or maybe slightly older. And then that's when you hit these first um, images of the slabs that would correspond to around 180 million years old if you use a 10 millimeter a year sinking rate. And at the same time, you um, you close the Cache Creek Ocean, which is uh, between this purple terrain and, and North America, which is sort of a precursor to this large Mexico era ocean. And so that sort of uh, all of these events could have initiated a um, intraoceanic uh, scenario here. And so in the model, which I started 170 million years ago, um, you see uh, westward subduction of the, the Mezcalera Ocean and the, the Angayuchim Ocean beneath these arcs here that correspond to parts of Alaska and Canada at the present day. And then the Farallon plate, instead of extending all the way to the margin, is slightly smaller and, it, and uh, subducts into um, arcs that are on the other side of this archipelago. And then in between, you've got a few transform faults. Um, yeah, and then in the early Cretaceous, sort of maybe from around, or, or the very latest Jurassic, uh, you have the start of um, subduction, eastward subduction underneath North America. Um, and this is like, uh, linked to the Nevada orogeny, which occurred around 155 million years ago. And so uh, the collision of the archipelago with uh, the continent is reflected in the geological data from this orogeny. Um, and uh, and it, it matches the, uh, the shape of the slab as well. And then another major tectonic change that's happening is um, uh, you have a big rotation of the Pacific plate. And that, that that could be related to uh, the formation of this slab here called the Alicetos slab, which you, you see sort of appearing from around 140 million years ago, um, as it's uh, 1,400 kilometers depth. And uh, that's uh, linked to this terrain that's in Mexico called the, the Alicetos terrain. And uh, um, you also, around that time, see the formation of the first accretionally uh, domains in the Franciscan complex. So this sort of could be over here at that time, but another proposition is that it could actually be at this trench and then has sheared upwards with the um, with the Farallon plate and uh, with the San Andreas fault much later. Um, and then later on, um, in the middle Cretaceous, you've got finally your, your sort of traditional Farallon underneath continent subduction style, but you do still have this ocean basin up in the north, the Angayucha Motion, and Alaska is still showing some intraoceanic subduction up there. Um, other events that are happening are um, the formation of the Western Interior Seaway. So as you've got loading of the continental margin with uh, this collision happening here, then that, the flexural response could have caused uh, your big uh, seaway happening across North America. Um, other events are the, the shutdown of the Alicetus arc because uh, this, this slab sort of uh, terminates upwards and, uh, and then you have your accretion, which is constrained by some carbonates and, and uh, pluton stitching at around uh, 103 million years ago. And then also, if you look at these two slabs here, uh, that could constrain the location of the Caribbean plate, which has sort of long been hypothesized to be a sort of trapped part of old Pacific crust that then squeezed between North and South America. But by looking at the tomography images, you can actually sort of directly constrain where it was and where it came from and what the early shape of the Caribbean plate was. Um, in the late Cretaceous, you have this uh, exciting event happening in Alaska, which is called the Great Alaska Terrain Wreck. And uh, you've got lots of very complicated rotations recorded in the paleomag of this buckling of the terrain wreck, and that uh, is, is reflected in this model as well. Uh, and uh, one of the driving of this events of this buckling um, could be the uh, northward translation of most of the North American Cordillera 
um, which is called the Baja British Columbia hypothesis. And so um, all of these terrains show um, inclinations much shallower than, than their present day locations, which shows that they were around 2000 kilometers north of the base of this paleo mag. And then in the late Cretaceous, they all sort of rapidly shuffled, shuffled up the margin, um, which could be related to um, the formation of the cooler plate, which is um, constrained by the magnetic anomalies in the Pacific. And uh, so that, that's like a really key event in the uh, history of the assembly of the North American Cordillera. Um, you also have this uh, new intraoceanic subduction zone in the North Pacific, um, which matches these slabs shown in the tomography there. And uh, this is linked to the Kronotsky and Olatorsky arcs, which are in Kamchatka at the present day. And um, they show like paleo latitudes from the paleo magnetism that they were you know, so this location during the late Cretaceous. And uh, so that sort of constrains where this uh, subduction zone was in the past. And another thing to note is that um, the margin of North America that I was showing previously was sort of very straight, not what it is at present day. And that's based on more paleo evidence um, that Mexico has undergone this big rotation. So prior to this time, you show like a straight margin of Mexico and, and California that uh, sort of closes this ocean basin a bit earlier more, which is linked to the geological evidence. And then starting in the late Cretaceous, that starts to rotate into the present day, presumably as, as the Caribbean is sort of sheared between them and sort of dragged along. Um, and then the very final override of this anger huge motion occurs in the Paleocene. And so that's sort of, even though most of the subduction has been along the continent for most of the Cretaceous, there's the very final bit, the sort of very end of the, the archipelago that, that you, you see in the tomography. And uh, that this is also the end of this northward uh, translation of uh, Baja BC terrains. And so that means that by the Paleocene, pretty much all of the terrains are in their present day location. And then you have the final subduction of this Orcas plate, which has been, you know, very old uh, crust in the middle of the archipelago, it finally subducts um, beneath the, the um, North American margin. And that's also been suggested uh, in, in previous studies, um, which refer to it as the resurrection plate. But while that is, this resurrection plate would imply that it sort of broke off fairly late from maybe the cooler plate or the Farallon plate, this Orcas plate really represents that very old ocean crust in the middle of the archipelago that's been there for around 100 million years. And then finally, um, the, the most recent events include um, eruption of the, the Yakutat and Seletia oceanic plateaus at, at the, the spreading ridge. And then they, they sort of move with the Pacific and the Farallon plate into their present day locations. And then you finally see Mexico in a sort of normal shape as well as some other terrains uh, in the Blue Mountains and in, in Northern California that, that go on, undergo some rotations and end up in their present day positions. You also see the end of this uh, previous interoceanic system there um, as that sort of ceased to be active at around 47 million years ago. And that's been uh, suggested as a strong hypothesis of why the Pacific plate suddenly changed direction um, around 47 million years ago. As if you have a northward directed subduction zone there, you would have northward motion. And then as that shuts down, it goes to more westward motion, which is recorded in the, the Hawaiian Emperor Bend. And so uh, the final bits of uh, terrain translation all occur in California in the most recent times. And this is mainly due to interactions with the um, San Andreas Fault. So when you have the Pacific plate and the North American plate coming into contact, you suddenly have no more subduction in this big stride slip fault. Um, and some of the terrains get trapped on one side and sort of rapidly move up. And then you also have this transverse ranges, which gets caught right in the middle. And then it goes under goes this really big rotation that's recorded in, in the paleomag data. And that's uh, further driven at the very end by the opening of the Gulf of California. Right here. 
So yeah, by combining like these geological, um, paleomagnetic and, and tom tomographic data, you can really sort of track where all these little terrains moved in the past. So hopefully you have a few ideas of what to be looking out for and we can look at the entire model when it's full. So, so here we go at the start, you've got just westward subduction uh, underneath uh, this archipelago here. And then uh, in the, here you've got this old AUKUS plate trapped in there. And then all of these other plates represent the sort of terrains that are sitting on them. And uh, yeah, around 155 million years ago, you get this collision event happening, the Nevada orogeny, and then you've got subduction beneath the, the continent. You've got the Alcita shutting down, like a long trench. And then here you start to see this buckling in the great Alaska terrain wreck before all of the terrain shoot up northwards in this Baja BC event. You've got your oceanic plateaus erupting here. And then you've got some more translations happening here when things sort of start spinning around and, and shuffling upwards. So uh, yeah, that's sort of the, the full tectonic history of the West of Western North America shown here. So if we just compare it to older, uh, like older models, you can really see a very significant difference uh, to, to what other models show. So here you've got just a, a traditional Andean style uh, subduction model where you always have the Farallon plate subducting beneath the North American plate uh, and uh, sort of relatively few plates going on. Whereas in the intraoceanic subduction model, there's lots of different oceanic plates, maybe like here you've got one, two, three, four, five, six plates, you include the Caribbean, there's like seven different little oceanic plates that, that are all interacting and, and colliding together. So it's a, quite a complex history, but um, all supported by the, the paleomagnetic data from these terrains, as well as their geological signatures, and uh, of course the tomographic images that allows you to constrain exactly where they were. Um, and so even though this looks quite complex, it's perfectly plausible because it's very strikingly analogous to the present day uh, Southwest Pacific. So this is sort of, uh, I, I know this image annoyed all of Australian people when I presented it there because it's uh, been flipped and rotated and, and it sort of messes with your brain a bit, but that allows you to compare it directly with uh, the, the setting of um, sort of Cretaceous and late Jurassic North America. So North America is very analogous to Australia. It's this large continent and um, it's gradually overriding this archipelago. So here you've got a subduction polarity flip from westward to eastward. And that's sort of similar to what's going on at present day Papua New Guinea. Um, and then you still have oceanic subduction beneath uh, Indonesia, as well as beneath like the, the Solomon Islands and Fiji. And so you can sort of tie these together and then maybe the Orcas plate is analogous to the, the Philippines plate. Uh, yeah. And so uh, a final way to sort of, sort of see what, what happens in, in North America is to look at motion paths. So uh, one of the original studies of the tectonic history of the Pacific, they sort of Engelbrecht and Natal highlighted this uh, sort of location around San Francisco and just showed this long sweep um, as North America sort of slightly moves north and then like always is moving to the west and, and uh, subducting the Farallon plate. And then a, a more modern study of the, the Muller model shows a very similar trend of just, you know, fairly simple, always beneath the continent. But if you, if you look at uh, the intraoceanic intra model, you have sort of stationary, so like here it's 120, but it hasn't really moved for like 20 million years. So you've got very stationary subduction down south, and then uh, it actually moves the other way to accrete to the margin before shuffling upwards with, uh, you know, coupled to the, the Farallon plate and as well as the San Andreas Fault around this time. And so what this shows is that many of the trains actually have moved very little distances in terms of the longitude space as they started much further to the west. And, um, and so by uh, sort of looking at all the paleomagnetic data, the, the seismic tomography, 
and making sure you adhere to all the geological constraints, you can get a very different uh, history of the, um, the tectonics of Western North America. So yes, in conclusion, I presented a quantitative plate model from uh, around 170 million years ago to the present day at a re resolution of 1 million years. And so there are around seven new tectonic plates that have never been proposed before. And uh, these are constrained by subductive slabs and paleomagnetism. And uh, you can really track the absolute locations uh, from these two data sets of where they were in the past. And then to, to make sure you match these data, as well as other geophysical and geological data sets, you really do need this intraoceanic subduction and archipelago override model. Um, and uh, crucially, this is very consistent with the other wider constraints, such as um, the movement of North America that's constrained by the Atlantic Ocean, as well as the movement of the Pacific from those isocons. And so, as you can uh, sort of very detail, give you a very detailed history of the tectonic setting of Western North America, and I think like definitely you could use this model method to uh, constrain other regions, and particularly this will be important in the Pacific realms, as that's where you've sort of lost all of your um, other data from to subduction. So, yeah, uh, hopefully a very good method for future studies. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. That was very cool. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can post them in the chat and I can read them out. I can start off with one. Um, <laughs> So showing Australia as an analog was really interesting, especially rotating it because you don't usually sort of think of it in that way. Um, could you do the same sort of thing in G plates, but then like push Australia's um, sort of configuration with the subduction zones forward to see if it would sort of match with um, the Western North America in the past? Yeah, so... Um... I'm not sure anyone's done that in G plates, but I did actually find a study where uh, someone had done exactly that. They sort of showed Australia sort of pushing into these terrains. And um, I don't have the figure in this slideshow, but it does show a sort of similar um, setting where it like sort of predicts that northward, uh, like sort of everything going against the margin and you've got a really big strike slip fault along the margin of Australia, which uh, you see with that Baja BC method is sort of, you know, it's sort of around here as this moves through here, you've got this big like shearing event happening between these terrains and, and uh, Australia as that, that occurs. So yeah, that was, um, yeah, actually I did find a figure, but it's not in this slideshow, unfortunately, but it's pretty cool that, you know, someone, it was about 30 years ago or so, they just did this random thought experiment and, and it perfectly matches like what I showed in, in this model. So that was kind of cool. Nice. Hey, Ed, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I guess I'm looking at the weird wrong screen. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I was curious about like, you have some in your reconstruction you have some of these terrains with double subduction zones or um yeah it's subduction with with plates other than the Farallon. and geologically or i guess geochemically do you see like signatures that may be related to different subduction zones or sediment input from different subducting plates like um yeah, how do like geological constraint, like, yeah, I mean, if you have double subduction beneath the Guero or insular plate uh, terrain, do you have different arc magmatic pack side of that terrain that you could train to, uh, to different plates subducting beneath that terrain? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't think you can really see the double subduction. Um, so that was mainly just constrained by the fact that 
obviously the Farallon has to go somewhere in this region yeah. and, and it's not going in here and in, in this sort of region here you do see it like quite a bit thicker there so that that's why that's the sub double subduction zones there um and then in terms of the geochemistry like there's been two like completely different interpretations that um you know like is either westward or eastward depending on how you sort of assume the the motion of the trenches if it's like advancing then you can kind of assume it's like westward or if it's retreating you can assume it's eastward and it's sort of like very up to interpretation so yeah that's why like sometimes looking at the geology is kind of hard and then you look at it and there's people said oh it's it's definitely eastward or it's definitely westward and then it kind of depends yeah. how you interpret those signatures um and then yeah so yeah, again, I'm not really sure about the, the, the sort of double subduction yeah. things, but you definitely guess... have some sedimentary, sedimentary um, sort of like fossils that are definitely not, not to do with North America that you sort of find in these regions. So that does sort of suggest that it, it was quite far from the margin. Um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Thanks. I think, I mean, it would have been super convenient if you had two different magmatic packages on either side of the terrain that you could just say, you know, this yeah. is related to subduction and from of the fair line, this is related to subduction. Yeah, that would have been uh, yeah. really and tied up with geologists usually not that, that yeah. clean, I the, guess. <laughs> this one here as well has since been, because this is, you know, like 170 million years ago or whatever. And it's since been like heavily like intruded by plutons and sort of right, yeah, metamorphosed. Right. So like certainly parts of this is sort of like quite hard to tell what was going on before those sort of be working events. Yeah. Yeah. I also have another question. I was just curious about the 0.2% uh, like DVP or VP anomaly. Why, like, how do you choose? I, I'm curious because I was doing similar things for the Caribbean, um, just trying to constrain the reconstruction on tomography. And I was using 0.5% just because it seemed the, I, I don't know, it, because it just seemed to conservative but like yeah how, are there papers that wrote write about like how not to pick this just arbitrarily um yeah i think like so there are some papers that have done it like really detailed and tried to like sort of find these little folds and then unfold it and they sort of okay. used around 0 0.2 0 0.25 sort of numbers um and then i've seen like other papers that just said okay, well, the maximum size is, you know, anything that's got a blue. So even these yeah. white ones, and it, it can't be any bigger than that. And then maybe a minimum size is, I don't know, 0.5 or something, like the really, yeah. really sharp ones. And then you sort of give a range of, of something that's happening. But if you, if you use this value, then it comes out of these are about maybe 500 kilometers wide. And so if you think that normally it's around 100 kilometers wide of the sphere, so it's sort of thickened by five times, but it's folded five times yeah. sort of thing, then that, um, you know, it kind of matches the time if you have like subduction, at, you know, uh, 10 centimeters a year or five or something like that, then it's sort of, you need a long time to, to build up these slab packages. And it sort of all works out if you use like those kind of widths for the slabs. Yeah. Cool. It'd be cool to incorporate the new deforming mesh into yeah, the, this exactly. Because like you know, most of these terrains here presumably have been like shortened quite a lot. So yeah, during this collision. So yeah, I had a question um, that had to do why, I mean, you have to obviously start somewhere in time, um, but there's some, a fair bit of evidence for Triassic subduction along the margin, and you, you get things started in the middle of Jurassic. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what the story was a little bit earlier in time? Yeah, so particularly in, in California, I think maybe this little blue one right there sure. uh, is sort of like the native Triassic arc. Um, and then um, the, the orange one, the, the Klamaths, 
then is what I interpret as the intraoceanic stage, and then you have the, the Sierra Nevada Atlas uh, later. So it's sort of three very distinct stages. And um, I didn't reconstruct the like prior history just because it's so deep in the mantle that like you can't really see the subduction history from the slabs. So it's like a bit of an unclear picture. But if you go to the uh, tomography here, then this very deep, you know, to like very like lowermost mantle um, represents that sort of native Triassic subduction beneath the North American continent there. Um, and then the, the, the fact that there's nothing at that depth suggests that it was then intraoceanic in the sort of late, late Jurassic and then back again to um, Andean style continental subduction after that. So yeah, you can sort of tell the history slightly from the slabs, but not in enough detail to sort of work out where these came from. So I sort of just started it at the, the times when you have you know, the best images of the slabs. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, my other question was: so you've you got something labeled there, Western Jurassic Belt. Is that, is, and that ends up in in uh, Seward Peninsula somewhere in Alaska? Is that right? Is, uh, I'm not sure what that refers to. Is that? Yeah. So that that I um is I'm referring to the um the sort of klamath mountains uh so uh, there's, i think dickinson he sort of called it the western jurassic belt at one point and, but it's uh like the say it's like just analogous to the insular terrain which is along alaska um it's sort of like you know yeah. the, the same package the same setting and again same setting as the guerrero terrain in mexico so it's sort of this big long arc um but sort of if you go to different places, they give it different names. Any more questions for Ed? All right. Uh, thanks again, Ed, for a very fun talk. Uh, that's it for this week. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>